You know, a lot of companies get hung up. Well, the law says we have to do this. The laws also have structural bias and barriers and racism. Let's just call it what it is. Yeah, absolutely. So you can actually be more progressive in your Mm -hmm. internal policies and they can go far beyond what you're required to do if you're willing to do the work. What would you tell our audience who identifies with you know, communities of color, when they come up against a barrier in a conversation. One of the frameworks is, you know, does this need to be said? Does this need to be said by me? Does this need to be said by me right now? Indeed, for me, to be quite honest, is one of the safest companies that I have ever worked for. Once you get the language for psychological safety, you experience the safety. Yeah. Sometimes you can mess it up because you resist what is foreign. Even at this level, like I always feel as as much safety as I have that it could just be gone. Yeah. I am Misty Gaither, but on Zoom, it's just Misty, kind of like Prince, like Beyonce, the one name thing. And when I think about belonging and what it means to me, it's quite simple. It's just being comfortable no matter what space I'm in, no matter who else is in that space, and being the only and just realizing that that is my superpower in that moment. Oh my gosh, you are here in real life at the studio. We've been talking about this. Welcome, Misty Gaither. Thank you. I am so happy to be here. I can't believe it's like no screen between us. Like it's like I could touch you like, <laughs> like we're in person. Thank you for being here. It is it's a dream come true for me. Oh I am gosh. absolutely in celebrity status mode here. Okay. You, it, this Misty Gaither, <laughs> Vice President of Diversity, Inclusion, Equity, and Belonging, plus... Yes. And plus. indeed. Please say the plus and we could talk more about that. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, I have known you for a while. Um, I think it's five years now. You and I had worked together at Twilio. Um, and then both of us came over to <laughs> Indeed um, by a particular individual mm-hmm. um, who will be very loudly named <laughs> Ms. LaFawn Davis. Um, who I will um, spend, I think, the rest of my life being loyal to, (laughs) doing whatever Um, capacity that is. Same, same. You you say here, I want to start here because I love this, and I want to share something that you probably don't (laughs) know. Oh, my gosh. I'm like, now I'm nervous because I say a lot of things, and I'm like, when they come back? So you said, my boss, LaFawn Davis, is someone I worked with at Twilio when I was interviewing for my job there. I said, expressing hesitation about the job, I don't know. I've never done this work before. Tell us about that story. So we're interviewing and I'm talking to her. It's like 30 minutes and it took forever to get this interview because she is a hard woman to get in touch with. And I forget what the question was, but at the time, the way that I was answering it, I was basically telling her why I wouldn't be able to do the job. And she literally kind of does, you know how she does. She like looks, she looks away. She's like, hold on. She's like, okay, let me let me go into auntie mode really quickly and let me tell you a few things. And this is why you can do this. And this is the type of person I need. And this is why this can be you, et cetera. And so then she goes into, you know, hiring manager mode and we continue. And <laughs> might I say the rest is history because now I have been working with and for her yeah. for, wow, five, five years. Yeah. So. yeah. Did you know? That I was sitting right next to her during that interview. No, I'm finding that out right now for the first time. Are you serious? So she's interviewing you. I didn't even know you. I didn't know you, right? Right. But I'm sitting next to her. She was against the wall where she used to where she used to sit in at Twilio. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting doing my thing, and I and I look over. I'm like, oh, she's interviewing someone. (laughs) Wow, that's cool. And I just immediately started eavesdropping Uh and listening. And I heard that moment. Wow. And then she gets off the phone and she turns to me and she said something. I can't remember what she said, but she's, it was basically you're, you're going to come on board and, and, and work with, with, with Twilio and, and her. And wow. it, was, it was a very fun moment. 
And, and might I add, because I think people don't realize, um, and it's important because when you do this work, like it is so important who you do it with. And there has to be a deeper yeah. connection because the work itself is so tiring. One of the things that I have heard you say over the course of your tenure at Indeed is your love for Chris Himes, the CEO of mm -hmm. Indeed. Can you talk a little bit about why yes. that is? Um, I have the, such deep admiration and respect for him. And one of the memories that stands out to me, it was one of my first visits to Austin. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting in our domain office, not too far from where lunch is served. And there are a bunch of more tenured employees around. Um, they don't look like me. So I'm like one of one in this moment. And I recognize mm -hmm. that, obviously, because of what mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. And there's more familiarity with that group. And um, Chris comes comes over and we simply have a conversation and I can see people kind of waiting in the winds because he probably needed to be ushered somewhere else. But what I love about him is that no matter how busy he is, he will make you feel like you are the only person mm. that is important in that moment because he's so attentive. And I felt that in that moment and I see him demonstrate that with everything that he does. Mm -hmm. Like he truly demonstrates and embodies like a servant leadership. And, yeah, you know, I, I want to acknowledge that we are all imperfect human beings, right? And so I've experienced him in a way where it just makes me question like how can I make this time if our CEO can make this time to have intimate conversations with small groups of people yeah. then how can I do the same you said which I love this I do this work as a black woman while I'm sitting in this seat I am not exempt from the experiences that black and brown people go through every single day Chris went on a discovery tour internally at Indeed did he not Mm -hmm. And he spoke to so many different communities of color to really understand um, how organizations are impacted mm -hmm. in different ways. Part of your journey in our coaching has been about allowing yourself to be seen in the world. Mm -hmm. And I received an email from you just a few weeks ago where you had forwarded an article about the tall poppy syndrome. Mm -hmm. Talk about what the tall poppy syndrome is. Talk about what it was like to journey through this trajectory of self-discovery in allowing yourself to be seen and supporting a CEO that actually prioritizes seeing. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the tour, because I think this will be helpful for people listening. And so most companies get caught up on just the static numbers. Like what's the percentage of people mm -hmm. who identify as X? Mm -hmm. And they do their normal, you know, uh, quarterly updates, their weekly Q&As or whatever the cadence is. Mm -hmm. And they have question and answers. But if you think about whose questions get the most upvotes, it's typically from the majority population. Yeah. So what he's done is he's created a space for women in leadership, VP and above that he meets with on a regular basis. Mm. And then he's also created a space for racial ethnic minorities who are not well represented in our company. So black, Latin, Native American, Pacific Islander. Um, and we meet with him also monthly. And one of the initiatives I asked him to commit oh. to was specifically black women at Indeed. And um, it's important because sometimes we get lost in the grouping when we have mm -hmm. to do that for data reporting and we lose an opportunity to really solve the problem by disaggregating the groups and how we all experience the, the workplace differently. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the tallest poppy syndrome and allow myself to be seen, that was a gift from my other coach. So I have... I'm just blessed in the sense that I have people who pour into me. Mm -hmm. And so I have a black woman coach that was a requirement, non-negotiable, so I can just be. Yeah. And she gave me that information, but that also is more of a, a culmination of information that I've had in the past. Mm -hmm. So I've always read the, um, I forget the study, but basically it's how success and likability is negatively correlated for women, mm -hmm. but positively correlated for, for men. And then there was one other thing that I'll try and recall a little bit later, but tallest poppy syndrome is basically showing up, um, having the, 
I guess, traditional forms of success, being present. And what I said to actually Chris recently, I said, I can show up, I can have all of my data, I can be well prepared, I can deliver information objectively. And no matter what, I'm going to be met with some type of resistance or a barrier or a roadblock. Or people start to see this rise in success, and there are some people who think they're supporting, but they're not actually supporting. There is, um, you know, a little bit of intimidation. There is jealousy. And so Mm -hmm. people tend to just kind of keep their heads low so they don't have to have that experience. And that's really how I've liked to operate. It's like if I'm just behind the scenes and making magic happen, then Mm -hmm. that's my safe space Mm -hmm. because then I don't have to to contend with the people who are, well, she thinks she's this and how did she, you know, get promoted so quickly and I don't understand while diversity is everywhere and that's a whole nother conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm probably not doing the article justice, but it is something that I encourage people to read because a lot of times I never like to say that people might be jealous, but the tallest poppy syndrome gives us data and it gives us more of an Mm -hmm. analysis of what we're actually experiencing. And it's like, it's okay. And for me, it was like, you're not crazy for feeling this way, for feeling like the pressure coming from a lot of different places. What would you tell our audience when they come up against a roadblock, when they come up against a barrier in a conversation? What would you tell our audience who identifies with you know, communities of color? Mm -hmm. How do you navigate that? How do you address that, especially in the moment? Well, one, take a deep breath. Yeah. Really, really and truly. And I think for me, it is do I need to address this in this moment right now? Like, what is the severity of the conversation? Mm. Who is impacted? And something that, um, you know, I'm going to talk about Chris a lot and LaFon a lot. So just be prepared, whoever's listening. (laughs) But one of the frameworks is, you know, does this need to be said? Does this need to be said by me? Does this need to be said by me right now? And so a lot of times I'm in places and I'm like, I'm tired of having to say the hard thing. And so what I would tell people is one, give yourself that opportunity to and be okay with taking a break. But if it's in a moment where it is decision time, it's go time and you have to say the hard things, the way that I say things and people laugh, but they know it's like a mistyism. I'll say, I'd like to invite you to think about that differently. Mm. Or if someone raises something and they have a different perspective and they want to try and sway the decision in a different way, Mm -hmm. what I'll say is, well, my perspective is the same on that matter. And here's why. And I think in those moments, and that's why I, you know, LaFon actually gifted me with this term. She's like, you are a businesswoman who happens to have subject matter expertise and a wide array of topics surrounding diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is different from somebody who's a practitioner. Mm -hmm. So I take all the goodness from the practitioners and the PhDs and folks that have the education and they go really, really deep. And I try and translate that into a language that my business leaders can understand. So I think an illustrative example of that might be we were doing some hiring. We were expanding into markets where we have more visible representation. Mm -hmm. The markets are Miami, Atlanta, Chicago. So you could figure out the representation that we needed. And, you know, we weren't growing aggressively, but we were establishing a presence. And the leaders at the time, they wanted to staff those offices with internal folks first as the leaders. And then they wanted to allow those leaders to hire. Mm. And so I'm like, hmm. Well, here's the data. You don't have anyone that I would say matches the demographics of that city and where we have an opportunity to improve. Mm. And I had to use myself in that case to help them understand, like, now you have to take on a risk. And the risk is that you're going to have to continue to work hard and maybe a little bit harder to staff up someone who is coming from the outside. But it's really difficult for me to believe that our work model is so challenging Mm -hmm. that someone who's been successful in sales or in customer success can't do this. Mm -hmm. And then it was like another example of watching a company do that and do it that way and where it truly became a racial divide. And so it's like, take on more risk. It'll be fine. 
and we will help you. And so it's pointing out the issue, yeah. giving it to them in a language that's digestible for them, and then offering to support. I love this. I love this so much. Talk about the four Ps. Talk mm. about Misty's brilliance that is tucked away in that phenomenally organized mind. Because the way that you talk about this whole DEIB topic is just, for me, mind blowing. When I think about the framework, you know, I look at historically what have we done and where have we gone, and we haven't gone really far. And um, so I said four Ps it's policies and processes. That is number one. If you're visual, just make that really bold in your brain. Policies and processes, then programs, and then partnerships. And so if I start backwards, if you think about a lot of the diversity work, everything is partnership related. Yeah. You know, funding is allocated for an organization for K through eight something, you know, and it's earmarks for something that's outside of the company or it's always centered around how we hire. And it's, let me partner with, you know, the company. So whether it's a Grace Hopper, whether it's an Afrotech, mm -hmm. you name the marginalized group that's not well represented in your organization. And there are a ton of partner organizations. And so the only problem with that is like, we don't have the data. There's no empirical evidence that shows by partnering with this organization, it actually increases or improves representation in your company. But you do get to check the box for doing something. Mm -hmm. We need them, but I just consider those a yes and because we have to signal to our internal employees that these communities matter. And a lot of those organizations have professional development components that are absolutely beneficial. And we need to signal to people who are looking at our companies, like what is our position, particularly in the environment that we live in today and how we treat people from different backgrounds at our organization. Mm -hmm. So then programs, everything is, oh, well, let's find a mentorship program or the women need to go and they need more developing. And I call BS on that. Mm. And so what I say is like we can do those things, but I call it a perceived skills gap because the people who are making those decisions oftentimes mm -hmm. are people who are a part of the majority population. And when you think about the tech landscape, it's primarily cis white men. Yeah. And so when we think about the impact of primary parenting responsibilities, it hits women harder. Mm -hmm. it, they have the same degrees, the same level of experience, yeah. yet and still we say we need to put them in a program. And the math just doesn't math. If this person is already having a challenge going from level three to level five, yeah. Not because nothing's wrong with them. It's something wrong with the process. And I'll get to that. But then you want to take them away from their primary responsibilities, put them in a program so they have to do extra work to demonstrate they can do their current work at another level. It just doesn't make sense no. to me. And so we, we do programs. It is important. But the difference in how we approach it, and this is like a huge partnership that we have with our talent organization, is that it's balanced. And there is some accountability on the leader. Mm -hmm. So if we have an expectation that you name the marginalized person or group of people going through this, hello, leader, you also have a responsibility to shift how you show up as well. Absolutely. So policies and processes. And so this is my like this is where I have the most fun because I like to like break things. I like to move past to know and ask why and like do it differently. And I have some people who I do that really well with internally. Shout out to Lisa Ramirez mm -hmm. and. And some other folks, but um, that's where all the bias and barriers exist mm -hmm. and it persists mm -hmm. because you can always go back to, oh, well, the process is this. And that's why I'm like, okay, well, let's fix the process. So the first thing that we did that, you know, is public and we talk about this often is inclusive interview rule. It's yeah. a play on the Rooney rule. And let me not even say that. It's our version of a much better Rooney rule because we literally dismantled our entire talent attraction process. Oh, wow. We changed how our organization um, is comprised. We actually changed compensation. We changed what 
success looks like for that group of people. And we we made our own rules to make sure that we could evaluate equity at every single step of the process, mm-hmm. not just at the end. Because I said to you the other day, a lot of times people say, oh, we'll do an equity review. And I'm like, an equity review does not equal an equitable process. Love it. And so policies give us the agency to really correct things that are structural and things that are systemic. And also, if the companies are like, oh, well, we don't have the same amount of money. Guess what? Not going to cost you much to change an internal policy. So you can still do the work. So that's why like my strategy and how I approach this, I won't ever anchor my strategy and, you know, try and affect change with something that has multiple dependencies on another organization. So we have to do the programs and partnerships, but you can 100 percent control Mm -hmm. your policies and processes. And might I add, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of companies get hung up. Well, the law says we have to do this. The laws also have structural bias and barriers and racism. Let's just call it what it is. Yeah, absolutely. So you can actually be more progressive in your Mm -hmm. internal policies and they can go far beyond what you're required to do if you're willing to do the work. I love this so much. Indeed, for me, to be quite honest, is one of the safest companies that I have ever worked for. Mm, Thank you. I, I am always so taken aback by the Indeedians that I get to meet. Mm hmm and connect with, and share an experience or a conversation with. Talk about the importance of a safe space. Talk about the impact of a traumatic experience at work, especially for women of color, especially for communities of color. Wow, that is, that's such a big question. And as, as I listen to you, I'm just thinking about what I need to share about my personal experience mm-hmm. and where I finally felt safe yes. at work to do, to do the work the way that I do it. And I was on a panel recently, and one of the questions was, when did your career kind of change? And what do you think the catalyst was for that change? And so, you know, I've had a lot of traumatic experiences and I've had experiences before I had the language to even describe what they were. Mm -hmm. Um, Starting back from like my first experience, even being hired to go work in South Florida. And there were two markets available, right? I could work in Fort Myers and then there was a position in Miami. And of course, you know, you need to speak multiple languages to work in Miami because it is such a melting pot. But it wasn't on the job description. And there were Mm -hmm. plenty. Plenty of people who only spoke English who worked in that market. Mm -hmm. But I only could recognize this later in life that that was like my first experience with, I would say, maybe discrimination, Mm -hmm. um, just being treated differently and being told that I only had one option Mm -hmm. and being told that by people who are in white bodies. Right. And so not that they intended to cause harm, but that's like one of the earliest memories that I have of that. And so um, another early memory is when I was interviewing for roles at, um, what are they called? Pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. And it was a black recruiter. And he was really honest with me. And he said, listen, they're not used to seeing a you. They are Mm -hmm. used to tall, blonde, thin. And so, you know, you're going to have to work twice as hard. (sighs) Just to get through the door with some of these doctors because you're so like the opposite of what they're Mm. used to. And so then fast forward, I move out of Florida. I'm back home in Southern California and they're doing all these diversity events, but they're not called diversity events in 2004. Um, And so they're like, hey, Misty, can you go? And obviously now I know it's tokenism because I'm like one of one. And I'm like, sure, I'll go talk to the students at USC. I'll go talk to the students at Mm -hmm. UW when I was in Seattle. And so I've had a lot of those experiences that cumulatively, when I look at them, Mm -hmm. they really impact how I interact and how I show up today. Mm -hmm. And so what I noticed, though, that started to change once I started working for people of color. And my first manager, and I'll shout her out, Claudia Baltazar, and she said, you know, 
do not be intimidated by these old white men who are Mm -hmm. leaders in this company. They are not better than you. They have more experience than you. And you're here because they need something from you. And so she just she said, just just realize and recognize that. And she was probably the toughest manager I have ever had in my life. And I thank her for that. But there was comfort. There was trust. There was just understanding that the profile of a black person, a person of color who knows that people will always see them as less than Mm -hmm. how we know we have to show up to prove that we deserve to be there. And just the sense of pride that comes with our community and being in these places where our parents and grandparents were not allowed to be in. But I think this context is helpful because it definitely Mm -hmm. informs, you know, the safe spaces. The other thing, too, is once you get the language for psychological safety, you experience the safety. Sometimes you can mess it up because you resist what is foreign. And so there are moments today where I'm like, I'm in a safe environment. I have to say this to myself. LaFawn has my back. Chris has my back. I have an internal, you know, board of directors that I know have my back, but it doesn't feel that way. Like, I still feel like my runway to prove my effectiveness to deliver results is always shorter than my peers who Mm. don't look like me. Or when Mm. I have mistakes and I make mistakes, I'm not perfect. Um, And when I make mistakes, that my opportunity to recover either doesn't exist or it is seen as much more severe than it is for other people. Yeah. And so it's this constant mental gymnastics, even in my seat. Yeah. Even at this level. Like I always feel as as much safety as I have that it could just be gone. Yeah. And um that that's kind of like the gift and the curse right. of of having these experiences. It's so heartbreaking to hear that, and yet I I know exactly what you're talking about. It's just so heartbreaking. I want to pull on this thread of safety a little bit more. Mm -hmm. What would you say to someone who has the perspective that IRG groups, ERG groups, are actually exclusionary, that they are not inclusionary, that they create division across an organization. How would you how would you respond to that? Wow. Oof. That that is that is a big question. And it's actually one that has come up. And candidly, people have asked if they can create groups for majority groups that are already represented, but they haven't been as um, artful in their questions, which has made it easy to say no. And so when I get questions like that, which what I kind of boil it down to is what about me? I think about um, a book, like what happened to you? And then I also think about a question like who hurt you Mm. and what's missing? like from your Mm. experience. And so sometimes people hear me say like, you know, we get so caught up on, let's just be honest. We focus a lot on race. Mm -hmm. We focus a lot on gender. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times at companies, it's because that's what we have the most robust data about. But what I've often said and what we're actually going to do is like, if the majority of our population is still like that cis white man, Mm -hmm. then we do have a responsibility to make sure they're included in the conversation. Absolutely. But when I get those questions, what that immediately highlights yeah. is a gap in knowledge and just missing context and critical education. So it just makes me want to probe more and just continue to ask why mm-hmm. so they can go on the journey of their own self-discovery. Mm-hmm. Like, why do you feel like this is exclusionary? Right. You know, like, and, you know, help them to see why they feel that way because they haven't had the experience. And so sometimes it's as simple as, and I, it's, it's an exercise that has been done and it might be a white paper, but having people just kind of relive or rethink when they've been excluded from a game of pickup basketball when they thought they were going to be invited to somebody's wedding or a birthday. So try and give them in that moment a quick memory. But then also the real thing is employee resource groups are for whomever, regardless of how you identify. And so if you are trying to make it about you, 
then we have a lot more work to do. Yeah. And so um, I think that that's how I would respond in the moment to that question. This reminds me of a conversation I was having just last night with my friend. And she's an executive coach. She Mm -hmm. um, works with some pretty, you know, big names. And she said to me, how have you been responding, Raj Kumari, when white men are coming to you and saying the following things? Like, when we have these diversity conversations Mm -hmm. around race and gender, et cetera, I'm feeling judged because of my skin color. I'm feeling like it's unsafe to be a white man today. Mm. That's what, that's what she asked me. And I said, well, I, I actually haven't been having those conversations. And she said that she's been having them pretty regularly. It's predictable mm. um, that what she notices in the room is that the people of color, specifically the women of color, are so grateful for having these conversations mm. finally. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet, the, the, specifically the men, the white men are being really, really having a tough time. How, how would you address that concern? Thankfully, I have not had it directly. And as I, and as I hear you, a couple of things come up for me, right? And the other phrase that people know mm-hmm. that I am I'm totally going to go there with this one is help me understand that a bit more. Mm-hmm. Like why and what happened? Give me something specific. Mm-hmm. Um, because if it's the conversation that's making you uncomfortable, like for me, that's a centering of oneself in an experience that's not about that person. Yeah. Or, you know, there might be a little bit of guilt for contributions to how other people are experiencing it Mm -hmm. or they feel like they've been neglected or there's just been this overwhelming amount of conversation Mm -hmm. about diversity, equity, inclusion, Mm -hmm. um, that, that they struggle with that. But something that's interesting to me in, I guess in the conversation with your friend, you know, the black and brown people are, you know, really grateful to have that space. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I would pick up on, can you be specific about when you feel this way and what groups you're around? I love Because what it goes back to is anti-black racism. Exactly. There are so many topics around marginalization that are more palatable for people. Mm -hmm. And I'll use, you know, veterans, Mm -hmm. I'll use age, Mm -hmm. and even LGBTQI a plus Mm -hmm. people are seemingly okay and that's like when those are easy ones to talk about Mm -hmm. but when i say okay well let's think about this through an intersectional lens and when people are like what i'm like okay well let's actually disaggregate this because there are black people in these groups Mm -hmm. there are brown people in these groups and then it's like the look of death and because then and i'm like okay so this is now this is now a race thing because i need to know what the issue is but everything always goes back to a lived experience and i think storytelling is like so powerful in those moments. And it's like, well, what, what do you need? Like, and the other thing is in my role, I'm like, okay, how do I, how can I help you? Exactly. I might be annoyed in the moment, but it's still my responsibility because that's the other challenging part, right? Like I do this work as a black woman, mm-hmm. but the reason why I'm in this seat doing this work is because I can have All of the attacks, all of the traumatic experiences, not be exempt from the things I'm here to interrupt and disrupt and still have to hold space for someone who is from a community that causes so much harm. I I have so much to say around that and so many questions. How? Yes. (laughs) How do we hold all of this trauma, Misty? How, how do we hold all of this trauma? I, I was, you know, last summer I was talking with um, Pradeep Gidwani, who I hope to have on the show. He is a, an MD who works with uh, children mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and trauma around children. He mm-hmm. has a conference, Early uh, Childhood Mental Health Conference, which I uh, attended and, and, and spoke. And at one point we were, we were talking on Zoom and he, he said, um... You know, I just wanted to make an observation, Rush Kumari. You're actually exhibiting symptoms of secondhand trauma. Mm. And I said, what? I remember you telling us yeah. that. Mm-hmm. And so he said, I-, I want you to look up some of the books by um, 
Laura Vandernoot Lipsky, I think she 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 would be really you know helpful for you. She mm-hmm. works around secondhand trauma, and and um, and overwhelm. So so that might be of, of value. And then it just was a huge epiphany moment for me. It was like, wait a second. If I am doing all of this self care every single day, three to five hours of self care every day, mm-hmm. given what I do, right? I'm on the receiving end of conversations of trauma all day long, five to seven days a week. Mm-hmm. And I'm exhibiting symptoms of secondhand trauma. That was when my light bulb went off, right? Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh my gosh, the business partner is that indeed that I, you know, hold mm-hmm. very dear in my heart and under my wing. They must too be going through this. Mm-hmm. And then it just kind of became this domino effect. All these people must be going through this across mm-hmm. the organization in so many different ways. As head of DEIB Plus, how do we begin to even address this, Misty? I know the way that I have started to address it is saying no to yeah. a lot of things. Um, I can't solve every single problem. You and I have talked about this and how I can approach this more strategically Mm -hmm. and not feeling like I have to be the martyr or I have to take all of the hits and really and truly um, not feeling guilty about rest. Didn't you have a nap last week? I did. (laughs) I'm not going to tell people what time it was, but I did. (laughs) I did. I did have a nap. I was so proud of you when you told but me that. But when I, you know, I had a, a later meeting, right, like yeah. into the evening, right. and I just recognized how I was able to show up. Like I had a clear train of thought. Yeah. I was just kind of on, but also to really kind of think about your question. I think we have to recognize that the problems that people want immediate actions for today, Mm -hmm. these are hundred plus year old problems. And just because I sit in this seat doesn't mean it's my responsibility to solve the problem. I can give people tools. I can have the vision. But this is one of those things. And another executive at our company who I'm like meeting and enjoying is our chief security officer, chief information officer, Anthony. And when he talks to us about security, he's like, it's not just the responsibility of my team to keep our company safe and to keep our job seekers safe. It is everybody's responsibility. And so now that's how I think about this work even more. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes I think the reason why we suffer so much from the trauma is because we feel the weight of it. We actually think that is how we get evaluated on effectiveness by yes. solving these big problems that there are really no solutions for. And I, I am a beehive fan. And so I think about this quote about Beyonce, right? Yeah. Like she rehearsed, I think it was like two months yeah. or six months for a two hour performance. You think that I am going to come in here and change a 20 plus year old culture with a program, <laughs> just a program and a partnership, so good. then then you know where you can go because it's just not going to work. <laughs> and so like and, and even though so I get good. down into the weeds and I beat myself up and I'm yeah. like, what does success look like? I feel yeah. like it's so empty. Yeah. And even when I'm in those intimate conversations with Chris, like when I'm in the, you know, the URM chats or the VP plus chats yeah. and people are like, well, I have this experience. And Chris is like, well, Misty. And I'm like, I'm having the experience too. <laughs> like, so, you know, I have to bring a little levity to it when it's safe to do so. But I think the more I realize I'm still doing a good job, even though progress is really, really slow, then that helps me with that. I, I love that. As we close out this conversation, what is your hope for black and brown women in organizations to experience in the coming years? So for me, that's actually twofold. Mm. My hope for us, and I'll say us, yeah. is, is really to divorce ourselves from the old way of thinking that there's only room for a few of us. Mm. Because as much work as we do in this space, I think Mm. sometimes we still fall victim to what we call crabs in a barrel mentality, Mm. or we become in competition with one another versus being a united front to face hard things together. Mm. And then if I take a step back, I would say, 
Also stop giving energy to imposter syndrome and recognizing it's okay to be uncomfortable when you're doing something new for the first time and, and own it in the ways that we see people who are not as brilliant, not as talented own spaces and are um, loud and wrong. And so the image that is in my mind, as I'm telling you this, there are two. Mm -hmm. And it's Black Lady Sketch Show. So um, if you're not Black and you don't watch the show, please watch it. Um, But also when Trevor Noah gave his closing remarks when he was leaving the Daily Show. Oh, my gosh. So those two images are what what's in my mind as I think about what I hope for, for yeah. women of color um, and, and, and black and brown women, for sure. Mm. Misty, I, I, I really could just keep this conversation going. I, I love talking to you. I love listening to you more. Thank you for sharing your brilliance with everybody on the show who's listening, who's watching. Mm-hmm. Um, it is such an incredible honor to have you. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Aww.